In this course, Introduction to Computer Literacy, the computer concepts you will learn include what a computer is, basic computer functions, how a computer inputs information, processes information, and outputs information, how storage works, the benefits of using a computer, how computers have evolved throughout history. Some of the computer terminology you will learn includes the terms CPU, or Central Processing Unit, Monitor, Keyboard, Vacuum Tube, Transistor, Integrated Circuit, Microchip, Mainframe, Terminal, Personal Computer, or PC, and Laptop. Computers are sophisticated machines with incredible capability. They operate at speeds measured in millions, even billionths of a second. They're powerful and complex. But to become computer literate, you do not need to know all of the complexities of a computer. Of course, the more you know about computers, the better. And in this course, you will learn a lot. You will find out what a computer is and how it works, including how information is moved, processed, and stored. In addition, you will find out why all computers, no matter how large or powerful, operate much like the computer you may have in your home or office today. We will start by looking at what a computer is. While computers are complicated machines, in general terms, they are really quite easy to understand. Simply put, three things happen in a computer. Information moves in, known as input. Information is changed, known as processing. And information is moved out, known as output. Input, process, and output. These are the basics of computing. To help you understand these basics further, think of a computer like a food processor. In a sense, a computer works like a food processor. You put food in, input. You process the food, that is, slice, dice, grate, or grind the food. You take the processed food out, output. Of course, a computer processes information, not food, but the procedure is similar. Let's look at how input, process, and output all work together in a simple computer setup. This simple setup has three main parts. A keyboard, where you input information by typing. The information flows inside this box to an area called the CPU, or Central Processing Unit. This is the center of processing activity, the place where information is changed, rearranged, or calculated. The monitor or screen outputs or displays the information. There are many other kinds of equipment known as devices that can be used to input information to a computer, such as a mouse or a scanner. There are also other devices a computer can use to output information, such as a printer. You will learn much more about input and output equipment and the processor in the course entitled, Hardware, the Power of Your Computer. But for now, if you understand the basics of input, process, output, you are well on your way to becoming computer literate. There is one more important computer basic to understand, information storage. One of the reasons computers are so powerful and valuable is that they can store huge amounts of information. Computers can store millions of records, pages of text, graphs, figures, virtually any kind of information. Information is put in storage after passing through special output equipment used for storage. The information can be stored in a variety of media, like a floppy disk, or what's called a hard disk inside the computer. Then, from these storage media, the information can quickly be retrieved, or input, back into the computer. When storage is combined with the computer's ability to input, process, and output information, you can accomplish a lot. For example, once in storage, specific information can be retrieved in a matter of seconds, or even fractions of seconds. Besides the ability to find information quickly, storage also saves a tremendous amount of typing time and makes changing, organizing, and rearranging information easy. For example, let's say you've typed a report on your computer and then stored the information. Later, you decide to make some revisions. Rather than retype the whole report, you simply retrieve the report from storage and type in the revisions. 
The computer's processor will do the rearranging of all the pages, including the revisions. In effect, retyping the report for you. And this is just a simple example of what storage can mean to you. Storage can contain huge amounts of information, volumes of work, calculations and data compiled by others. Storage also gives you the important ability to access software programs, that is, instructions that tell your computer how to perform jobs. You will learn much more about software in the Learn PC course entitled Software, Productivity at Your Fingertips. But for now, all you need to know is that storage is a critical part of the information flow into and out of the computer. The entire flow, input, process, output, combined with the storage, is the foundation you need to become computer literate. This foundation gives you an understanding of how all computers work, from the largest corporate mainframe computers to the smallest personal computers. Regardless of their size, computers all work basically the same way. They input, process, output, and store information. In fact, if you look at the history of computers, these basics have always remained the same. What has changed is that the size and price of computers have dropped dramatically, while the amount of information they can handle and the speed at which they work has increased incredibly. In fact, the speed and capacity of today's computers is breathtaking. If humans had to do what some of today's computers do, it would take the equivalent of one million mathematicians working 24 hours a day and consuming a ton of scratch paper per second to match the speed of the computer. The speed and power of today's computers is no accident. Computers may have been around for only a few decades, but they're the product of centuries of thought and development. In fact, people have been working to develop tools to input, process, output, and store information for thousands of years. One of the first machines developed for this purpose was the abacus, an instrument used for calculating numbers by sliding counters along rods within a frame. The origins of the abacus date back to 500 BC in Egypt, but they were developed and used extensively in eastern countries, including China and Japan. Here is how the basic principles of computing apply to the abacus. People provide the input in the form of numbers to be added, multiplied, or divided. The abacus helps process the numbers and shows the output or results. The abacus can even be used to store information temporarily until the numbers are transferred to paper. The abacus helped eastern countries calculate numbers faster. But the abacus didn't catch on in the western world. It wasn't until 1642 that the western world produced its first computing machine. The machine was called the Pascaline, named after its creator, the famed mathematician Blaise Pascal. The Pascaline was a handcrafted brass box about the size of a milk carton and had a series of wheels that could add or subtract long columns of numbers. The basic principles of today's computers were also present in the Pascaline. Information was input, in this case, numbers. The Pascaline then processed the numbers and provided a result, or output. Like the abacus, the Pascaline could only temporarily store the results until the numbers were transferred to paper. Even though the Pascaline could do the work of six accountants, it was not a commercial success. Even back then, people feared the computer. They worried that the Pascaline would create unemployment. More than 200 years later, the great industrial revolution was underway, and the world was ready to use the power of machines for industry and manufacturing. One man who saw the potential of using that power for processing information was an American named Herman Hollerith. Hollerith started work at the U.S. Census Bureau during the same time the 1890 census was underway. The already gigantic task of counting the nation's growing population was made even more difficult by the massive influx of immigrants from every corner of the world. To make matters worse, at that time, virtually every computation had to be done by hand. Hundreds of clerks were needed to keep up with a mountainous flow of paperwork. For this reason, the previous census had taken more than seven years to complete. In fact, by the time the previous census was finally finished, the figures were already obsolete. Needless to say, the government was looking for a way to make tabulating the census faster and easier. 
Hollerith found the answer with a system using punch cards and a revolutionary new tabulating machine, the electrical enumerating mechanism, a machine that would soon usher in a new era of information processing around the world. The punch cards were used to input information into the tabulating machine. The machine then quickly processed the information and produced results or output. Punch cards could also be used to store figures after processing. In other words, all the basics of the modern computer were present. Input, processing, output, and storage. Using Hollerith's ideas, the Census Bureau was able to complete the 1890 census in only two and a half years, one third the time it had taken in 1880. Hollerith's card system was hailed as a success on the cover of national magazines. The apparatus, praised one writer, works as unerringly as the mills of the gods, but beats them hollow as to speed. In fact, Hollerith's invention met with such praise that he formed the Tabulating Machine Company in 1896 to market the idea. After a series of mergers and acquisitions, in 1924, the company became known as International Business Machines, now more commonly called IBM. Hollerith's computing machine was revolutionary, but it was only the beginning. Many more computer advances were to come, each driven by the need to make inputting, processing, outputting, and storing information faster and easier. The forerunners of today's modern electronic computers were developed for military purposes during World War II. The most famous was developed in the United States and was called the ENIAC, short for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. That's a big name for a big machine. The ENIAC weighed more than 30 tons and consumed enough electricity to light a small town. But the ENIAC didn't just take up space. The ENIAC could also perform computations faster than any machine then known, about 5,000 additions per second. News of the ENIAC's speed fascinated a war-weary nation. One awestruck reporter commented that science had finally produced a machine that worked faster than thought. The ENIAC was the most sophisticated computing machine of its time, but again, the computer basics remained the same. The ENIAC needed input or information to work with. The ENIAC then processed the information and produced a result or output on punch cards. What made the ENIAC unique, among other things, was the speed at which it processed information. The ENIAC's high-speed calculations were made possible with vacuum tubes that relayed information using electrical impulses. In other words, the ENIAC was the world's first electronic computer. But one of the ENIAC's big drawbacks was the amount of time needed to input data. Each calculation required literally days to set up involving thousands of switches, dials, and cables. Advances over the next few decades in input, output, and storage technology would make computers more powerful and much easier to use. These advances included improvements in punch card technology and the advent of paper tape and magnetic tape for storing information. Greater storage capacity meant that information could be input and output at ever-increasing speeds, making computers easier to use. At the same time as input, output, and storage technology advanced, computer processors were also advancing, getting smaller, faster, and more powerful by the year. In the early 1960s, transistors were introduced that could do the same processing work as a vacuum tube, but take up only a fraction of the electricity, space, and time. A computer using transistors worked nearly 40 times faster than the ENIAC, performing more than 200,000 additions per second. Processing units got even smaller and faster in the 1960s with the invention of the integrated circuit. Integrated circuits like these could hold a number of transistors and perform about 1.2 million calculations per second. That was 260 times faster than the ENIAC. The first computers to use both integrated circuits and transistors were known as the mainframe computers. Many different users could access the mainframe's processor and storage through a terminal on their desk. Terminals are an input keyboard and an output monitor. 
Because terminals do no processing, they are often referred to as dumb terminals. The mainframe could perform complicated tasks involving millions of calculations, such as processing all the financial records of a large corporation or making accurate weather forecasts and designing complex weapon systems for the government. Despite the many advances made in the late 60s, mainframe computers were still so big and expensive that only the government, large corporations, and universities could afford them. But this began to change in the 1970s when the Intel Corporation introduced a new kind of integrated circuit called the microprocessor. These tiny pieces could hold thousands of circuits. Microprocessors have now advanced to speeds exceeding 15 million calculations per second. In other words, in just four decades, computer speed increased from 5,000 calculations per second with the ENIAC's vacuum tubes to 15 million calculations per second with the microprocessor. Microprocessors carried all the electronic components needed to make a computer on a single tiny chip of silicon known as a microchip. In fact, the Intel Corporation advertised their new circuit as a computer on a chip. The microchip made possible the microcomputer, also known as the personal computer, or PC. By the late 70s, PC technology was sophisticated enough and inexpensive enough to be within reach of most organizations and even many households. Dozens of companies like Apple and Tandy started selling microcomputers to schools, businesses, and individuals. And in 1981, IBM introduced its own microcomputer. During the 80s, many of the less popular computers were discontinued. As this shakeout occurred, the world of microcomputers split into two main groups, IBM and Apple computers. Apple includes the Macintosh family of computers. Many other companies make microcomputers that are compatible with or work like the IBM and Apple models. You will learn more about the world of IBM and Apple computers later in this series. Rapid advancements in technology have made the computer faster, smaller, more affordable. In fact, some of today's laptop computers, called laptop because they are small enough to fit on your lap, contain the same power as the massive mainframes of the 1960s at a tiny fraction of the price. These rapid advancements have also made computers easier to use than ever. Today, computers aren't just for scientists and university professors anymore. People with little or no computer experience can sit down at a typical computer and, with proper training, begin using its power within hours. That's because through the years, nearly every advancement in computers has further increased the simplicity and effectiveness of inputting, processing, outputting, and storing data. In other words, equipment advances make inputting or giving the computer information easier than ever. Advancements have also increased the ease, power, and speed of processing information. And they have made the output, including screen displays and printed copies, easier to read and use. Finally, storage capacity has dramatically increased, allowing you to store, find, and retrieve millions of pages of data with a touch of a finger, even from a PC in your home or office. Where is the computer headed in the future? No one knows for sure. Making predictions about the future of computers is risky. For example, in 1949, the U.S. Department of Commerce predicted that the whole country would need only 100 computers. They guessed a little on the low side. The fellow who designed the first mini-computer kit in the 1970s thought he might sell 800 in a year. He sold 400 the first day. Specific predictions may be risky. But if the future is anything like the past, continuing advances are bound to produce computers that are even more powerful. But remember, no matter how powerful or sophisticated computers become, their basic operations remain the same. Inputting, processing, outputting, and storing data. This is the power and purpose of the tool we call the computer. And the more you know about this tool, in other words, the higher your computer literacy, the more you will be able to harness its power to serve your needs. You have now completed this course, Introduction to Computer Literacy. In just a short time, you have learned many fundamental computer concepts, including what a computer is, basic computer functions, how a computer inputs information, processes information, 
and outputs information, how storage works, the benefits of using a computer, how computers have evolved throughout history. In addition, you have learned many computer terms, including CPU, or Central Processing Unit, Monitor, Keyboard, Vacuum Tube, Transistor, Integrated Circuit, Microchip, Mainframe, Terminal, Personal Computer, or PC, Laptop. As you have seen, expanding your computer literacy is surprisingly easy. You have already gained an understanding of the fundamentals that make all computers work. In the coming course, you will build on this knowledge. Once you have finished this computer literacy series, you will have the basic skills necessary to fully participate in the exciting and ever-expanding world of computers. The opportunity is yours. This course is divided into four lessons. Input devices, output devices, communication and storage devices, and the computer processor. Through these lessons, you will learn how information is stored, how computers communicate with each other, how the computer's processor works, and what is computer compatibility. When we are done, you will have a solid understanding of hardware. As a result, you will be more computer literate, and computers and these magazines will be much more clear to you. Before we actually begin lesson one, a few words of introduction about hardware. The logical place to start, of course, is to define hardware. Simply put, hardware is equipment. Equipment is called hardware because it is hard and you can actually touch it. When talking about computers, there's another term you often hear, software. Software refers to computer programs. There are many kinds of software, from accounting programs to entertainment and games. We'll discuss software in much more detail in the Learn PC course entitled Software, Productivity at Your Fingertips. But for now, you should know that hardware and software work together. To help you understand how they work together, think of an audio tape player as hardware, a piece of equipment. Think of the music on different audio tapes as software. To hear the music, the hardware and software must be used together. Computer hardware and software work together in a similar way. In this course, we'll focus on the hardware or computer equipment. As you learned in the Learn PC course, Introduction to Computer Literacy, information in a computer flows through input, process, output, and storage. There is a type of hardware for each of these. The hardware that processes the information is called the processor. Hardware used to bring information in and out of the computer is called a peripheral device. Peripheral means hardware that is outside the main computer box. The word device means a piece of equipment that is used for a specific type of job. For example, an input device is a piece of hardware equipment that is used to input information to the computer. Similarly, an output device is used to output information from the computer. There are also devices that can do both, that is, both input and output information. Most of these devices are used for communication and storage. In the four lessons on hardware that follow, you will learn about all four types of equipment. When you have finished, you will have a thorough understanding of the power of your hardware. And you will be even more computer literate. In lesson one, input devices, you will learn the following concepts what the most common input devices are, and how they input information. Some of the computer terminology you will learn includes computer keyboards, mouse, drawing pad, touch screen, scanner, barcode reader, music synthesizer, microphone, add-on board, and expansion slot. There are many ways you can input information into the computer. You can input information by touch, you can input visual information, and you can even input sound. In fact, if you use a little imagination, you can almost think of the computer as taking information in using many of the same senses that people use. To input this information, there are a number of input devices available. In this lesson, you will be introduced to the most common. To help you understand these input devices, we will speak of them in human terms and divide them into three main groups, touch, sight, and sound. We'll start with devices that you touch to input information. 
Perhaps the most obvious input device is the computer keyboard. There are a number of different types of computer keyboards. Basically, they all work the same way. The keys in the center are arranged the same way as a typewriter. For the most part, they work like a typewriter, except that errors are easier to correct. If you hold a key down, it will continue to type. Using the backspace key or the DEL or delete key, you can erase what you have typed. Most keyboards have number keys arranged like the keys of a calculator. This is called a numeric keypad. People who input a lot of numbers often use the numeric keypad. Computer keyboard also has keys used to input information that typewriters and calculators do not have. We'll point out some of the more important of these keys. These keys with the letter F and a number are called the function keys. On some keyboards, they are along the top. On others, they are on the left. Each key performs a special function or job. The jobs vary depending on what software you are using. These keys are called cursor movement or cursor control keys. You can also use some of the keys on the numeric keyboard for cursor movement. The cursor is a flashing bar on your computer screen that shows you where your typing will appear. These keys move your cursor up, down, left, and right. The home key will usually bring the cursor to the upper left corner of the screen. Page up, page down, and the end key are also used for cursor movement and are described in the guidebook that came with this course. Two other special keys are the control key, marked CTRL, and the alternate key, marked ALT. They work something like the shift key on a typewriter. For example, if you type a key, say the number 8, an 8 appears. If you hold the shift key and type the same key, an asterisk appears. The control and alternate key have a similar effect on many keys on the keyboard. This gives your keyboard a lot of versatility and at the same time eliminates the need for a lot of extra keys. The return or enter key is another important key to point out. The enter key tells the computer to please input or enter the words, numbers, or command you have typed. The enter key is one of the most frequently used of the computer's special keys. Together, the keyboard's letter, number, and special keys allow you to input a tremendous amount of information. The faster you type, the faster you can input information. This input device, a mouse, does not depend on your typing, but also uses your touch. This device is called a mouse because of its small rounded shape and long tail-like cable. A mouse is used by moving it around on a flat surface like a desktop. A pointer on the screen moves as the mouse is moved. You press the button or click the mouse when you want to choose something on the screen. With a mouse, you can easily move the pointer on the screen, draw and move pictures, and give commands to the computer. In many cases, a mouse is quicker and easier to use than a keyboard. Another input device, the drawing pad, also inputs information through touch. Using a special pen, you touch the pad and input drawings directly into the computer. Engineers, architects, drafters, and artists all can take advantage of the drawing pad for design work. Using a keyboard, drawing pad, or a mouse in a sense is like touching the computer's screen with your finger. A touch screen lets you input information by actually touching an image or word on the computer screen. Touch screens can quickly input data and are well suited if you do not need to input a lot of information. Touch screens are also useful for people who don't know how to type. All of these input devices, keyboard, mouse, drawing pad, and touch screen, input information through your touch giving your computer fingers, so to speak. Different input devices let you input visual information, giving your computer eyes. One such input device is the scanner. Scanners read information that is printed, typed, or drawn on a piece of paper. Scanners can quickly input drawings or pages of text. Another input device that inputs visual information is a barcode reader. Barcodes are small bars of different widths. 
They are found on many items. The codes stand for different things like prices, dates, size, and so on. The barcode reader is simply placed over a barcode on an item. The reader can quickly input the information represented by the barcode into a computer. Barcode readers have many applications, from pricing groceries to delivering the mail. Just as a scanner and barcode reader give your computer eyes, there are a number of input devices that give your computer ears. They input sound. For example, music synthesizers can input music and other sounds into a computer. And a microphone can input speech. Hearing and understanding the human voice, known as voice recognition, is a challenging job for a computer. Voice recognition is of particular value to people who are unable to type. Advances in this type of technology are revolutionizing the way we use computers. You have now been introduced to input devices that input through touch, sight, and sound. We should mention that most of these input devices, and for that matter many output devices, need their own special computer board in order to operate. A typical board looks like this and is referred to as an add-on board or card. They generally snap in place inside the computer in a slot called an expansion slot. The more expansion slots a computer has, therefore, the more input and output devices you can use on the computer. Computer manufacturers often advertise how many expansion slots are available in their computer. In this lesson, you have learned the following computer concepts. What the most common input devices are and how they input information. In addition, you've learned many computer terms, including computer keyboards, mouse, drawing pad, touch screen, scanner, barcode reader, music synthesizer, microphone, add-on board, and expansion slot. In sum, you have learned that information can be input into the computer in many ways. Input devices are a critical part of the information flow of a computer. You now have an understanding of the input devices needed and available to make information flow into your computer. In Lesson 2, Output Devices, you will learn the following concepts what the most common output devices are, and how they output information. Some of the computer terminology you will learn includes monitor, graphics card, resolution, film recorder, video projector, overhead projector, dot matrix, daisy wheel, laser printer, pen plotter, parallel port, serial port, speaker, and voice synthesizer. As you learned in the lesson on input devices, information can be input into the computer in many ways using many different devices. In human terms, information can be input by touch, sight, and sound. There are devices that can output information using many of the same senses, if you will. Now we will look at some of these output devices. We'll start by talking about devices that give you output you can see. The most obvious is the computer screen or monitor. The computer monitor shows you the information you are working on at the moment. A monitor is like a window that gives you an instant view of information that you have input into the computer or information that has been processed. Monitors are either monochrome, that is one color, or multicolor. Multicolor monitors are often called just color monitors. Most monochrome monitors are either green, amber or white. There are many types of color monitors. Each has different abilities. That is, some show colors better, some show finer detail. The ability to show detail is known as resolution. A monitor uses dots of light to form characters and graphics. Low resolution monitors use fewer dots. They show less detail. High resolution monitors use more dots. They can show more detail. On a high-resolution monitor, letters and numbers are easier to read. Graphics are clearer or sharper. You may have heard the letters VGA, EGA, and CGA. These are different types of color monitors. Your guidebook describes in more detail the capabilities of these and other monitors. 
We should mention that to display many graphics and special text features, monitors require a computer board like this, known as a graphics card. A graphics card is an add-on board that's snapped into one of the computer's expansion slots. Monitors are an ideal output device for individuals, but for a large number of people, there are better output devices, like film recorders and projectors. A film recorder is an output device that outputs the computer information onto slides that can be projected. And with output devices that connect to overhead projectors and video projectors, information can be output and projected directly from your computer to a screen or wall. Monitors, film recorders, and projectors let you output information visually. But you can do more with output devices. You can output information that you can not only see, but also touch. That is, you can output information onto paper. Because you can touch this output, it is called a hard copy. The output device used to do this, of course, is the printer. There are many different kinds of printers. The two most important features of printers are their speed and print quality. Speed is measured in the number of characters printed per second, CPS, or the number of pages printed per minute, PPM, and the number of lines printed per minute, LPM. Print quality is described by terms like draft mode, the lowest quality, which would not be used for presentation, but would be perfect if you need a quick copy. Near letter quality, or NLQ, and letter quality, or LQ. Letter quality print looks like it was done on a high quality typewriter. Examples of each are in your guidebook. Printer speed and quality vary with the type of printer. To make this more clear for you, we will describe four types of printers. Dot matrix, daisy wheel, laser printer, and pen plotters. Dot matrix printers form characters and graphics by printing small dots on paper. Most have switches that let you select the quality of the printing. Generally speaking, the lower the printing quality, the faster the printing. Some dot matrix printers produce letter quality output that is so good, you would think the text was typed on a typewriter. Daisy wheel printers are letter quality, like a typewriter. This is because instead of dots, a daisy wheel printer uses fully formed characters, like a typewriter. The characters are on a wheel that looks like a daisy. As you probably guessed, the trade-off of this quality is reduced speed. A laser printer gives you the best of both worlds, speed and quality. Laser printers output whole pages at a time. They're known for the excellent quality of their printing, their ability to print different type styles, known as fonts, in different sizes, and their graphics printing capability. The pen plotter is a totally different type of printer. This output device is fascinating and fun to watch in action. The pen plotter actually draws with colored pens on paper or plastic. Pen plotters draw graphs and diagrams with amazing quality. They do take some time, however. You should know that printers need to be connected by a cable to a card in the computer. There is a receptacle on the card called a port. There are two kinds of ports, parallel and serial. Some computers have both. Most printers use a parallel port. There are other devices that can be connected to these ports as well. To sum up this section on printing, pen plotters, laser printers, daisy wheels, and dot matrix printers vary in their speed and in their print quality. But all of them provide you with hard copy, output that you can see and touch. Now we'll move on to discuss a couple of devices that provide you with output that you can hear. A speaker is an output device for sound. Most computers have a built-in speaker and some musical capabilities. To hear more sophisticated music, you can output information through a music synthesizer and amplifier and larger speakers. This lets you be the maestro of different instruments, even an entire orchestra. To hear a voice, you would use this output device, a voice synthesizer. Among other uses, the voice synthesizer can be used to assist people with speech impairments. You have now been introduced to the myriad output devices available to you. In this lesson, you have learned the following concepts. 
what the most common output devices are, and how they output information. In addition, you have learned many computer terms, including monitor, graphics card, resolution, film recorder, video projector, overhead projector, dot matrix, daisy wheel, laser printer, pen plotter, parallel port, serial port, speaker, and voice synthesizer. Whether through sound, sight, or touch, you have a lot of options for bringing information out of the computer. As you learned earlier, the same is true of input. Together, these devices give you a tremendous amount of flexibility and power. Over time, as you work with computers, you will likely take advantage of a majority of the devices you have learned about in these lessons. In Lesson 3, Communication and Storage Devices, you will learn the following concepts. How computers can communicate, how information is stored, and what are the different types of disks. Some of the computer terminology you will learn includes modem, baud, fax, disk drive, drive head, floppy disk, hard disk, optical disk, access speed, byte, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, and tape storage. You have now been introduced to the most common input devices and output devices. We mentioned at the beginning of this course that there are some devices that can be used both for input and output. These devices are sometimes called I.O. devices. Most of these devices are used for communications and storage. We will start this lesson by describing two input-output devices that are used for communications, modems, and faxes. We'll begin with the modem. A modem lets you input and output information over a telephone line. Some modems are outside the computer. Some are built in. With a modem, you can share information with computers in a different location or get information from computerized libraries. Briefly, here's how a modem works. Your computer outputs information to a modem. The modem changes the information to sounds and sends the sounds over a telephone line. A modem on the receiving end changes the sounds back to information and inputs the information to another computer. So, modems can be used as both input and output devices. The speed at which a modem works is measured in a unit called a baud. The higher the baud number, the faster the modem can input and output information. Your guidebook describes baud rates in more detail. A fax adapter is another device that can also both input and output information over a phone line. Fax, or facsimile machines, send copies of documents and pictures through phone lines to other facsimile machines. With a fax adapter added to your computer, you can both send, that is output, and receive, that is input, information with anyone who has a fax machine or a fax adapter in their computer. A modem and a fax adapter give you the ability to send and receive information almost anywhere in the world. These two input and output devices turn your computer into a powerful telecommunications tool. There is a different kind of input and output device that also gives your computer power, a disk drive. The disk drive is used to input and output information that is in storage. As you learned in the Learn PC course, Introduction to Computer Literacy, one of the reasons computers are so powerful and valuable is that they can store huge amounts of information. Then they can retrieve and input that information from storage at great speeds. The disk drive is the device that performs this storage and retrieval. Because storage and disk drives are so important, we'll now discuss them in some detail. First, what actually does a disk drive do? Sometimes the drive takes computer output and stores the information on a disk. In this case, the disk drive is an output device. A disk is like a file cabinet. In fact, information in a disk is stored in files. There are three kinds of disks. All of them hold files. There are floppy disks. These are some examples. There are hard disks. They are usually built into the computer. 
For this reason, they are also sometimes called fixed discs. And there are optical discs. This is an example. These storage technologies, or media, can store hundreds of thousands of pages of text. Disk drives also take or retrieve information that is stored on disks and put that information into the computer. In this case, the drive is an input device. Disk drives are capable of finding and retrieving this information from storage and inputting the information into the computer in fractions of seconds. So sometimes a drive outputs information to storage, other times the drive retrieves and inputs information into the computer. Disk drives that use floppy disks, hard disks, and optical disks can store and retrieve information. What varies is the storage capacity of each of these kinds of disks. Also, the speed of the disk drive used for each of these kinds of disks varies. This is known as the access speed. We'll talk about storage capacity and access speed now. Storage capacity is measured in bytes. A byte is usually equal to one character of information. A kilobyte is 1,000 bytes. Often, a kilobyte is referred to just as K. For example, 360K is 360,000 bytes. A megabyte is a million bytes, sometimes referred to as a meg. Different floppy disks can store different amounts of information. The range is generally between 360 kilobytes to well over a million bytes. For example, this disk can hold over 1.4 megabytes, or 1,400,000 bytes. That is over 800 double-spaced typewritten pages. Your guidebook contains more specific information about the storage capacity of different floppy disks. Most personal computers use three and a half inch or five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Some use both. If you were to remove the protective sleeve from these disks, you would see a thin, flexible disk of plastic coated with a magnetic film. The disk drive spins this disk and uses a magnetic head similar to an audio tape recording head to store and then retrieve data on the magnetic film. Most computers have one or two floppy disk drives. They're often referred to as drive A and drive B. Your guidebook shows some common drive configurations. One of the nice things about floppy disks is that they are removable. The disks can easily be used by others and in different locations. Floppy disks must be handled with care. The exposed magnetic film should never be touched. You should not write on a disk except with a felt tip pen and the disks should be protected from heat, smoke, dust, sun, and magnets. You should know that the access speed of a floppy disk drive, that is the speed that information can be stored and retrieved, is the slowest of the three disk types. A hard disk drive offers much faster access speed and higher storage capacity. 50, 60, and 80 megabyte hard disk drives are commonly used. Some hard drives can store well over 100 megabytes of information. This is equal to more than 52,000 pages of information. Imagine storing all that information in less space than a child's lunchbox. The hard drive is often referred to as drive C or D. A hard disk can store so much information because it is actually made up of a number of disks. They're made of metal. The machinery inside a hard disk drive is fast and very precise, so a hard disk drive has a much faster access speed than a floppy disk drive. However, the precision of a hard disk drive requires careful handling of the computer. The head of a hard disk drive is sensitive to bumps and jarring, so handle and move your computer gently. And an optical disk drive is yet another step further, offering even greater storage capacity and access speed. An optical disk, also known as a CD or compact disk, can store gigabytes worth of information. A gigabyte is one billion bytes, or a thousand megabytes of information. Unlike floppy and hard disks that store magnetically, optical disks use laser beams to store information. Optical disk technology can put an entire reference library on your desktop and give you the ability to find and retrieve the information you are looking for in seconds. Optical disk, hard disk, or floppy disk 
No matter what type of disk you're using, your disk drive is much more than just an input and output device. The disk drive is your link to storage, and storage is one of the computer's greatest sources of power. We should mention that there is another commonly used storage medium, magnetic tape. Retrieving information from magnetic tape takes much longer than from disk, but these tape card backup system in case disks become damaged or lost. The tape recorder and player, like a disk drive, is both an input and output device. In lesson three, communications and storage devices, you have learned the following concepts. How computers can communicate. How information is stored. And what are the different types of disks. In addition, you have learned many computer terms, including modem, baud, Fax, disk drive, drive head, floppy disk, hard disk, optical disk, access speed, byte, kilobyte. Megabyte, Gigabyte, and Tape Storage. The completion of this lesson on communications and storage devices combined with the earlier lessons on input devices and output devices gives you a solid understanding of the hardware used to input, output, and store data. This understanding is an important part of being computer literate. One major component of hardware remains for you to master, the computer's processor. We will examine this exciting and critical component in the next lesson. In lesson four, the computer's processor, you will learn the following concepts what the computer processor is, what is processing power, processing capacity, processing speed, and internal memory. Some of the computer terminology we'll learn includes bit, megahertz, 8088, 8286, 8386, clones, 68,000, RAM, and CPU. The computer's processor is the center of all the computer's activity. All input devices lead to the processor, and the processor is the source for all of the output devices. Storage also leads to and comes from the processor. All of the computer's input and output devices serve the processor. 
Having now discussed all the input and output devices, we are ready to examine this center of activity. So we will conclude this course by teaching you about the processor, also known as the microprocessor. The processor is a chip inside of the computer that processes information. Processing information means changing the information by rearranging, calculating, or organizing the information. To become computer literate, you do not need to understand exactly how the processor does this. But there are three features of processing that you should understand. Processing capacity, processing speed, and internal memory. In general terms, the more capacity, speed, and memory a computer has, the more computing power it offers. Manufacturers often advertise the capacity, speed, and memory of their computer. We'll explain all three features, starting with capacity and speed. Capacity and speed refer to the processor. And an easy way to understand capacity and speed is to think of a processor like a mouth chewing food. The amount of food that can be chewed depends on two things. How big the mouth is, the capacity, and how fast the mouth can chew the speed. A mouth with a lot of chewing power would be a big mouth that can chew fast. The power of processors is measured in a similar way. Some processors have the capacity to chew large amounts of data. This capacity is measured in a unit called a bit. Bits are described in detail in your guidebook. Also, like the mouth example, some processors can chew data at a very high speed. Therefore, when people talk about a powerful processor, they mean the processor can chew or process a large amount of data and process that data quickly. The computer's processing speed generally described in advertisements as the clock speed, it is measured in megahertz, a megahertz being one million electronic pulses per second. Generally, the higher the megahertz number, the faster the processing. For example, a processor that runs at 20 megahertz processes information roughly twice as fast as the same processor running at 10 megahertz. Some computers let you switch between different clock speeds. This lets you use some computer software that only works at slower clock speeds. 
Your guidebook has more detailed information about clock speed. Many IBM and IBM compatible computers use microprocessors designed by the Intel Corporation. Generally speaking, the higher the microprocessor model number, the higher the processing capacity and speed. Processor model numbers are often seen in computer advertisements, so we'll tell you about some of the more common model numbers. IBM's first computers, the IBM PC and PCXT, used an 8088 microprocessor. A more powerful processor is the 8286, sometimes just called the 286. This is the processor found in the computer called the IBM PCAT, and all copies are clones of the AT. The 8386, or the 386, as it is commonly called, is more powerful. The next generation, the 8486, is even more powerful, and so on. Again, the most important thing to remember is that, as a rule, the higher the number, the more powerful the processor. Your guidebook has a listing of the most popular microprocessor model numbers and the computers that use them. Apple and Apple compatible computers use different microprocessors designed by either the Commodore or the Motorola Corporation. The Motorola family of microprocessors has a different series of numbers, like 68,000, 68,010, 68,020, and so on. Regardless of their model number, all of these processors work the same way with information. Again, what's important for you to understand is that the computing power of these processors varies depending on their processing capacity and speed. As we mentioned earlier, there is another feature that affects a computer's processing ability, internal memory. Internal memory is the amount of workspace available to the processor. To help you understand this, think of internal memory like the amount of workspace on the top of a desk. On a small desk, you can only work on a small amount of information at a time. A large desktop lets you work with a lot of information at once. You can work on bigger, more complex projects faster because you have more information out and quickly available to you. 
the amount of space in the computer's internal memory is similar to the amount of space on the top of a desk. A large amount of internal memory will allow your computer to work on bigger, more complex projects. Therefore, the more internal memory your computer has, the better. Internal memory is often called RAM, or random access memory. There is a very important thing you should understand about the information in internal memory or RAM. That information is only being stored temporarily. In other words, RAM contains information that has been input into the processor and is being temporarily used and worked on. For example, when you input some letters by typing on your keyboard, the information that appears on your screen is in RAM. If you shut off your computer, that information is gone. RAM only temporarily store the letters. To use our desktop example again, the information on your desk would be in RAM, but only when you're at your desk. As if your company had a rule that information on your desktop would be cleaned off if you left your desk. If you want to save information that is in RAM, you must use your disk drive and output the information to a disk. This is one of the most important concepts of computer literacy and is worth repeating. Information in RAM is temporary. When you turn off the computer's power, all the information in RAM disappears. For long-term storage, you must output and save the information on a disk. Information remains stored on disk even after you turn the power off. Once information is stored on a disk, you can retrieve and use the information any time. All you do is input a copy of the information from the disk into RAM. The original remains unchanged on the disk. On your screen, you see the copy that is temporarily stored in RAM. If you wish, you can make changes to the copy. When you have finished, if you want to save your changes, you must again output the information from RAM to long-term storage. That is, save the change information on a disk. We should point out that RAM and disk storage are often confused with each other. Remember, RAM is temporary internal memory. Disks are for long-term storage. When a manufacturer advertises that their computer contains a certain amount of K or memory, like 640K, 
This is the internal memory or the RAM of that computer. Similarly, when a software publisher advertises the minimum amount of memory needed to run their software, again, they are referring to the internal memory or RAM of the computer. If you look inside of a computer, RAM is found on chips like these. In many computers, you can add more RAM chips. Technically speaking, these RAM chips, together with the microprocessing chip, are the main components of the central processing unit, or CPU. The power of your CPU, then, refers to three things. The capacity and speed of your microprocessor, combined with the amount of internal memory or RAM in your computer. This is the essence of the hardware used for processing. The term computer or the box actually refers to the CPU plus all of the electronic components needed to bring information into and out of the CPU, including the fan, speaker, add-on cards, hard disk drive, floppy disk drive, and power supply. And even all of these components of the computer are not enough. To process information, you need a complete computer system. You need input devices that input the kinds of information you work with, like text, drawings, and sound. You need output devices that give you results in a useful form, like printed reports or slides for a presentation. And you need disk drives to store and retrieve information. The power of your complete computer system hardware includes the computer box, plus input and output devices and storage media. In this lesson, you learn the following concepts. What the computer processor is, what it is processing power, processing capacity, processing speed, and what is internal memory. In addition, you learn many computer terms including bit, megahertz, 8088, 8286, 88, clones, 68,000, RAM, and CPU. By finishing this lesson, you have now completed this course, and you have achieved a good level of computer literacy.
You have learned about all the major hardware components that go into a complete computer system. With this computing hardware, you have a system that gives you the power to take advantage of the most modern technology, information, and communication available. But there is one more thing you need. Software that tells all this hardware what to do. You'll learn about software in the Learn PC course, Software, Productivity at Your Fingertips.